to uh, have you turn in your Bibles this morning to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. We're going to be looking uh, later on at, about the temptation of Jesus. And, uh, you know, there are certain things that we don't talk much about as far as Christianity goes. And it kind of reminds me of the disclaimers that you see on television for certain advertisements. Uh, I'm thinking of pharmaceuticals in particular. It, it intrigues me. Of, of, uh, they tell you how great this pharmaceutical is, and then a guy talks real fast and goes through about 99 things that you might get if you tr actually took this drug. And uh, one of them, I uh, actually looked up on the internet to see what the side effects of it is. I'm not gonna tell you the name of the drug other than it's used to, to fight depression. Uh, and you, but if you take it, you want to watch out because the side effect is dizziness, lightheadedness, nausea, vomiting, tiredness, excess saliva, drooling, blurred vision, weight gain, drowsiness, and constipation may occur. If any of these effects persist or worse, you notify your doctor or pharmacist promptly. Tell your doctor immediately if any of these unlikely but serious side effects occur. Fast pounding heartbeat, fainting, mental mood changes, increased anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts, weakness, feelings of restlessness, mask like facial expression, shakiness, tremors, muscle spasms, stiffness, trouble swallowing, swelling of the ankles and feet. Tell your doctor immediately if any of these rare but very serious side effects occur. Seizures, signs of infection such as fever, persistent sore throat. But this drug may rarely cause a condition known as tardive dyskinesia. In some cases, this condition may be permanent. Tell your doctor immediately if you develop any unusual uncontrolled movements, especially of the face, mouth, tongue, arms, or legs. This drug may infrequently cause a serious, rarely fatal, nervous system disorder, neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Seek immediate medical attention if you notice any of the following rare but very serious side effects, confusion, fever, fast heartbeat, muscle stiffness, increased sweating, I'm not even going to list that one, uh, a very serious allergic reaction to this drug is unlikely, but seek immediate medical attention if it occurs. Symptoms of a serious allergic reaction include rash, itching, swelling, especially the face, tongue, throat, severe dizziness, trouble breathing. And the last one is the best, I think. This is not a complete list of possible side effects. <laughs> if you notice any other effects not listed above, contact your doctor or pharmacist immediately. So there you have it. The, uh, the things that, that we don't, it's the small print. It's uh, the disclosures, you know, that uh, we don't talk about much. We just in faith take these things and hope they'll work out. And I think some of that applies to Christianity as well. You know, we want to talk about the good things, and God is great, and God is good, and, and that's certainly true. But there are certain things that sometimes we don't warn each other about that are actually listed in Scripture. And when we come upon these things, we tend to get a little disillusioned, and we wonder, well, this Christianity thing just isn't working because we experience these, you might say, side effects of Christianity. And that's what we want to talk about today. Uh, and the end result is that we're going to talk about, through all this, we get God's power. We experience God's power in our life, but there's a, a stage that we go through, a certain set of stages. And, uh, you know, the Bible talks a lot about power. That when, when we receive Christ, we receive power. In Acts 1, 6-8. It says, they were asking him, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or epics which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So there's something about when we become a Christian, there's a power that's involved here. Um, and Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go to the Father. Now, Jesus did some pretty miraculous things. 
didn't he? He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He forgave sins. He did a lot of great things. What he was saying to his disciples is, you will do even greater things than these. Now, that's power. And that's the same power that you and I have available to us. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, exceedingly abundantly, beyond what we can ever ask or think, this is the power that's available to us. And so my question to you today is, how do we see this power working? When we look around, why aren't we seeing this great power? And that's what we want to talk about today. And, and to understand this, you've got to realize that there are callings in the Christian life. Now, we talk about being called to the ministry. And certain ones feel that they're called, and so they go get training. And we ordain them, and uh, something just dropped. I'm not sure what it was. <laughs> Hopefully it wasn't my notes. But uh, we ordain them, we set them apart, and we say, okay, now you are called. But the fact is that we are all called. There are callings, and uh, the callings are true. Um, in fact, uh, in Romans 11, 29, it says, For the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. Now, I've studied wills a little bit, and when you have an irrevocable will, it means it, it doesn't change. No matter what happens, nobody can change it. It's irrevocable. And that's what the callings of the Lord are in our lives. And the first calling is a call to holiness. Uh, in 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, it says, But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. And there, that's an actual quote from Leviticus in the Old Testament, even though it's found in the New Testament. It's mentioned four times in the book of Leviticus that the Lord says, Be holy, for I am holy. And when he says something that many times, it's for emphasis. We need to pay attention. Now, what does it mean to be holy or to be set apart for holiness? Uh, well, that's exactly it. When you're uh, something that is holy, it's set apart for special service. Now, in our house, we have a set of silverware, and it's, it's really nice stuff. And I, I don't think it's exactly pure silver, but I think it's like got a silver coating on it or something. Anyway, it tarnishes. And, but it's set apart. We have a, a nice chest, and, and our granddaughter refers to it as the treasure chest. And that's where we keep this special silverware that's set apart. And we don't use it in our everyday use. You know, we don't use it to uh, clean out the garbage disposal and, and get it stuck down there and, you know, turn it on and the spoon gets all cut up. We don't do that with this special stuff, and that's what we are. We're set apart for special service. And we also have, a, we have two sets of dishes. We have our everyday dishes, and then for us, it's our Christmas dishes. And they get, they get stored in the attic, you know, and every Christmas, we will haul them down, and they're red and green, and uh, little Christmas decoration. But that's our special, it's set aside just for Christmas, you know. And that's what we are as Christians, we're, as to be holy means to be set apart for special service. So that's the first calling, and, and nothing wrong with that. I think we'd all agree with that, that we need to be holy as, as the Lord is holy. But the second calling is the one that we don't talk about much. And so I'm going to whisper it. Uh, actually, it's the call to suffering. The call to suffering. Now, who, who wants to volunteer for suffering? You know, none of us do. But this is part of the Christian life. And when we come upon suffering, if we don't understand this, we may scratch our heads and say, well, what's wrong here? I thought when I became a Christian that my life was going to change. I was going to be happy all the time. And great things were going to happen. And now all this trouble and temptations and, and testings are coming in my life. And this Christianity thing just doesn't work. Well, no, it is working when we go through suffering. 1 Peter 2, 20 and 21 says, But when you do good and <clears throat> suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. So did Christ suffer? Oh, yeah, yeah. 
He did. And so are we going to suffer? Well, yeah, we're called to follow in his steps. 2 Timothy 1, 8 and 9 says, Share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. And so, uh, you know, I don't know if you've studied prophecy. I, I think a lot of you have. I know one of our Bible studies is going through Revelation. And in the study of Revelation, you come across this concept that in the future, there is going to be seven years of what the Bible calls the Great Tribulation. And one of the teachings that, that I kind of lean toward is that as Christians, we won't go through that tribulation. We're going to be raptured out. I believe in that teaching. Uh, and now, there are others that disagree, good Christian people that say we will go through the tribulation. Uh, and so I don't know where you stand on that. But, but for me, I've been taught, and I kind of like this idea, that we don't have to go through the great tribulation. And the problem with me is that then I, I kind of bounce off of that and I say, well, since we're not going to go through the Great Tribulation, then maybe we're not going to go through any tribulation. And that is a false idea. Because Jesus himself said, in this world, you will have tribulation. He went on to say, be of good courage, for I have overcome this world. But nonetheless, we will have tribulation uh, here in this lifetime. Now, 2 Timothy 3.12 says, All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And the first century Christians understood this. You know, Peter and Paul and the apostles, they all understood. They were taught by Jesus, and Jesus didn't pull any punches. He said, you know, be ready for this. You're going to go through it. And so uh, there's a story in uh, Acts chapter 5 where the apostles were out preaching and teaching and the Pharisees were all upset about it because people were coming in from all over. It says that even as uh, the shadow of Peter, people would just long to, to have his shadow cross because they were here as a shadow. And so people were coming in from all over. They were gaining this popularity. And the Pharisees said, enough is enough. If you guys say one more thing about this Jesus, you'll be arrested. Well, they said, we've got to serve God rather than men. And so they kept teaching. And sure enough, they got arrested, thrown in prison. An angel of the Lord came at night and set them all free again. They went right back in the temple, which wasn't very far away from the jail, and started teaching again. The next morning when it was time for their court, the Pharisees said, said go get them. They weren't in jail. This guy said, I saw them teaching over in the temple. So they rounded them up again, and they warned them again, don't teach in the name of Jesus. And it's just as a precaution, we're going to flog you, you know, which is a hard whipping. And so these apostles, all of them, went through this whipping. And, man, you know, if you went through a whipping, what would your attitude be? I'd be sad. I'd be hurting. I'd be wallowing in pain and, you know, where's the etc. and all the rest. These guys were rejoicing. And why were they rejoicing? Because they were rejoicing that God would deem them important enough to suffer the cause. And so that ought to be our attitude as well. But, you know, it's something that we just don't always talk about. Jesus had full disclosure. And he said in Matthew 5, Blessed are you when men cast insults at you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely on account of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And so the first Christians, uh, they had no problem. I mean, they, it was tough, but they knew that this was something they were to expect. Now, uh, years ago, when I was about five or six years old, my father said, how would you like to go to a football game tonight? Well, I'd never been to a football game. And we lived in Monmouth. We lived on Jackson Street, right near where uh, Jesus <coughs> Restaurant is now. And so he took me and we walked up to the field at the college where the high school played in those days. And I saw the most amazing thing. There were bright lights and there was a crowd of stands with the crowd just jam packed in there. And there were guys out there running up and down and having a great time. And the crowd was just cheering their hearts out. And man, sometimes I had to wonder what was going on. The, the jolt of the crowd, the, the noise, the level. 
was just amazing. And so on, on the way back home, my dad said, uh, how would you like for the crowd to cheer for you someday? Would you like to be a football player? I said, yes, I so would like that. That'd be great. And so for years after that, I would dream about playing football and then the crowd cheering and all that. Well, he didn't tell me everything about football. And so uh, <laughs> when I was a sophomore in high school, I, I went out for the team and, uh, and I would weigh about 145 pounds. Now, your sophomore year of football is the toughest year because they throw you in with the varsity guys to the seniors and juniors. And these are grown men, and, and you might still be a little boy. And, and I was kind of in that category. So they have these drills, these tackling drills, and what I discovered was you wanted to find, you wanted to position yourself in line across from somebody that was about your size or maybe even smaller. And so I was doing that in this drill, and here were these big, burly seniors, and you know, stay away from them. And so I'll never forget this. There were the two of the biggest guys on the team that we had this drill where there were two guys and one of them was a blocker and one of them carried the ball and then a defensive guy that had to shed the blocker and try to make the tackle on the guy with the ball. So here were these two big burly seniors uh, at weighing close to 200 pounds or if not more. And uh, so then another big burly senior got on defense. I thought, whoo, whoo, boy, I'm glad he jumped out there. And then coach blew the whistle and he said, now wait a minute, he said, McElroy, you get in there on defense. <laughs> <laughs> and immediately my brain went to work. How do I get out of this? And I figured it out right away. I thought, if I just fall down, then <laughs> it'll be over and it'll be the next guy's turn. So I did, and as I fell, the guy who was supposed to block me just kind of mashed his helmet right into mine, just kind of mashed me into the ground, and uh, you know that's the price you pay. So the whistle blew, and, and I went back in the back of the line and uh, waited for the next ones to get out. And then the coach blew the whistle, and he said, "Let's have that same crew go again." <laughs> so I got out there again, and, and, and he said, "Now this time, uh, McElroy, let's put up some resistance here." So I guess he was on to me, and so this time I <coughs> tried to block the guy, and, and he matched me back about five yards before he fully steamrolled me and crushed me, and then the guy went on. And so I thought, well, at least that's over, and got back in line. Coach blew the whistle. You know, that's not good enough. He said, let's have those guys go again. And so a third time, and this time the guy uh, matched me back 10 yards, and for some reason, the ball carrier decided he was going to take off, and so he squirted around instead of staying behind the blocker. And with all everything I had, I dove out and I just barely grabbed the shoelace of this guy, and it was enough to trip him up and I made the tackle. And uh, fortunately, at that time, the head coach, who was over in another girl, blew the whistle, and everybody had to go. And I was so glad that was over. But uh, that was the testing, that was the tribulation of football. I mean, nobody ever said that, hey, these guys are gonna be mean. They're gonna, they're gonna growl at you. They're gonna try to hit you as hard as they can. All of a sudden, the cheering of the crowd and all that kind of faded into the distance and it didn't seem to matter much. And I made a decision at the end of that practice. I thought, uh, I'm gonna quit. <laughs> That's the easiest thing to do, I'll quit. And then I had a second thought. And I thought, uh, my dad won't be happy with that. And my dad, is, some of you have met him, and he was a really big guy, about 6'3", and weighed about 300 pounds. And, uh, so he didn't want to argue with him, and so I thought, well, I've got to keep him happy, so I can't quit, but I thought, I will just play as hard as I can until I get hurt, uh, until I break a leg, and then I'll be on crutches, I'll be on the sideline, people will sympathize with me, and uh, I'll, I'll be out of that thing. And so that was how I uh, made it through that. But, you know, that's what happens to us in the Christian life. It's, it's just a microcosm. Uh, we talk about how things are going to be great, and Christ comes into your heart, and you have your best friend, you can pray to him, and you can take anything to him, and he'll get you through everything. And sometimes we get the idea we're just not going to have these troubles, these trials and tribulations, and they come anyway. And it's not, it should not be a surprise to us. Jesus said, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. 
And uh, so I just want to conclude with this by saying that uh, we have these three callings. Now, we didn't get to the third one. The first one is that we are filled with the Holy Spirit. That uh, he, uh, when we become a Christian, we are set apart to, for holiness. And, and the Holy Spirit fills us. We've we heard about the filling of the Spirit. And in Luke chapter 4 here, we didn't really get a chance to look at that. But in the first verse, it says that Jesus was filled with the Spirit when he was baptized. Uh, you remember that story that dove came down and came upon his shoulders. And that was a a symbol of the Spirit, and Jesus was filled. And we talk about being filled with the Spirit, won't that be great? And it is. But then the next thing is, the Spirit led him into the wilderness for testing. And, and that's what happened then. That's the next step, the very next step. And it happens immediately, almost. And you, one of the questions you can use is, well, how do I know if I'm filled with the Spirit? Well, you'll know if you're going through testing and trials then you're filled with the Spirit. You know, you've had that. And so for 40 days, Jesus went through that. And you know the temptations when I go into that. But then at the end, if you look down at verse 14 of Luke chapter 4, it says that when he came back, he didn't come back in the filling of the Holy Spirit. He didn't come back in the leading of the Holy Spirit. He came back in the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's why we go through the suffering and tribulation. Because once we go through that, then we have the power that these guys were talking about, that the Bible's talking about. Anyway, we're going to close now. And uh, as if you're here today and you've never received, you've never experienced that power, maybe you've never even experienced the filling of the Holy Spirit or, or that initial being set apart for service because you've never received Christ as your Savior. And we don't want to let this opportunity go by without offering this to you. And if that's the desire of your heart, you can, you can accept Christ wherever you're at. You can accept Him right there in your seat. And you can do that silently. Or we also offer this time to come up publicly as we sing our, our closing song here and just say, that we would ask you, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? And if you can say yes to that, then we, that's, that's what the Bible tells us to do, is to acknowledge Christ before others, not just in our hearts, but to speak it with our lips, to say it with our mouth. Let's stand and say